One fish, two fish. Axe bow, X bow. Slim size, thin size. Hey, what's the difference? We currently enjoy an explosion of variety in bow shapes, each suited to a different task. Now these may all look the same from a cursory glance, but don't get fooled. Nearly the same bow shape used on a different vessel may work for an entirely different reason. This time we are going to distinguish between four prevalent bow shapes, the conventional hull, the X bow, the X bow, and a wave piercing bow. Before we go shopping, what are we looking for in a bow? Well, what does it need to accomplish? First and foremost, the bow must provide smooth water flow to minimize resistance. We need a sharp entry point, we need a fine and even transition from that initial stem at the front all the way back to the parallel midbody in the middle of the ship. On top of that, we're going to pack in several different competing goals. Looking at this list on your screen, you can see that these requirements for bow design contradict each other. For example, a bow with minimum resistance needs to be skinny, but that offers little reaction to oncoming waves, so a skinny bow may have poor sea keeping capabilities. Designers are often forced to pick priorities, and unfortunately, crew experience doesn't always win out. Balancing these conflicting needs is especially interesting because it reveals plenty about the intended service for each bow type. Before going any further, we need to dive a little bit more into the idea of water on deck. We need to explain the importance and the two different categories that we typically use. First, spray. This involves light, foamy water that is mostly composed of air. It may look big and scary, and if you get caught in it, it might knock a crew member over on the deck, but it presents very little danger to the actual ship's structure. The second type of spray though, green water on deck, may seriously threaten the ship. Green water refers to a large wave completely swamping the deck, a wall of solid water that punches into everything it can find. This might tear loose any small equipment on the deck, and it also robs you of your forward speed. Notice in this video that after the wave hits, the ship's motion nearly stops. Further, all that water adds a lot of weight on the deck of the ship, which might create dangers to stability for some vessels. Now clearly we design our ships to survive this green water event, but the forces and the motions are so violent that when we're picking our perfect bow shape, we would prefer to avoid green water events. First contender, the conventional bow. A conventional bow really gets designed in two parts, an underwater section and an above water section. The underwater section often has a bulbous bow attached to it. This is typically seen on larger freighters and that is optimized for calm water resistance. Above the water though, we typically rake the stem forward and flare out the sides of the bow. The conventional bow prioritizes all efforts to keep the main deck from submerging. The flared sides tend to direct spray sideways away from the main deck, and the increasing width of those sides creates a strong nonlinear reaction as the wave rises up the bow. The farther that water rises along the bow, the harder that the bow is going to push up, trying to avoid submerging into the wave. This nonlinear reaction is also a major point of irritation for the sailors. It results in jerky pitch motions that end up fatiguing everybody because they're just too busy holding on against these jerks. To try and combat that jerky motion, we have the forward rake of the bow. This rake naturally tapers the bow to a point, which is meant to cut into the waves and brunt that initial shock of entry. But I've got to say that the results usually fall far short of those original intentions. That rake also has another purpose for preventing submergence of the main deck. You see, it increases the moment arm of the bow. As the bow submerges, the center of submerged volume pushes forward due to that rake, which increases the resistance to pitch motions. Your moment arm gets longer as the center of volume goes forward. As a result, 
the ship often is going to feel like it lands on a hard edge, rather than sinking into soft waves. The conventional bow was designed to act as a hard brake against pitching motions and water washing on deck. Option number two, the X-Bow. The X-Bow focuses on providing a smooth ride to the crew, and this design I would say usually applies best to larger vessels. Patented and developed by Ulstein, the X-Bow features straight water lines back to the shoulder of the bow. You can see that in the diagram at the bottom of your screen. The bow maintains this straight sectional shape going vertically up through the decks above the main deck. You can also see from the picture at the right that those water lines only show modest amounts of gentle flare as they're going up. So we're trying to maintain this straight section shape. Now I have to say, I found very little scientific information readily available about this concept. But Ulstein's marketing material claims that this bow achieves an impeccable array of improvements. I'm going to just restrict my summary to attributes proven in published papers or reasonably inferred from general naval architecture knowledge. A 2017 paper did show that the X-Bow reduced the ship resistance for certain types of hull form. The study used CFD analysis to compare the X-Bow design to three typical hull forms of a container ship, a fast container ship based on a Series 60 hull, and a DTMB destroyer. Uh, these are some of the standard reference hulls that we like to go to. The study focused specifically on reductions in wave making resistance for these hulls. It demonstrated that the wave making resistance for the container ship hulls and the destroyer hulls were reduced. But I would exercise caution when in taking these results. These were based on a single set of CFD comparisons to only three standard reference models. This is not a large comparison and I would not consider it sufficient cause to generalize these benefits to all vessels. So what are the trade-offs and the pros and cons for an X-Bow? Well, by shifting the buoyant volume aft to the shoulders, the X-Bow smooths out the entry of the wave against the bow. Rather than immediately meeting a flaring bow, the wave meets this nice tapered look. It's like a wedge driving into the wave rather than a mallet. The straight water lines maintain a linear response to the water as it rises up the bow, which avoids any jerky pitch motions that would wear down the crew. The stem of the bow rakes aft, blending into a large radius curve that rises several decks above the main deck. This also helps to smooth out the ride by trying to keep the pitch moment constant. As the wave rides higher and higher up the bow, the moment arm moves further and further aft by small amounts because of that reversed rake on the bow. All of these things combine to create a nice linear response that has nice gradual pitch accelerations, all resulting in a smooth ride for the crew. Now for the consequences. I'm going to go out on a limb here and infer that when the designers originally came up with the concept of the X-Bow, they intended to permit it to partially dive into waves. This would allow it to have a slow response rather than a hard jerky response to submergence. However, that partial submergence combined with the slope of the reverse rake creates a large amount of spray. Now to compensate for this, the designers of the X-Bow moved the first exposed deck far above the waterline. If you look up the pictures for X-Bows, the first exposed deck is typically two to three decks above the main deck. Now that's important because that's adding in protection against extra spray to keep the windows at the bridge deck clear. I generally like the X-Bow, but I personally see one major limitation. I would personally only recommend this for large vessels. Based on the motion simulation that you see here, I infer that the X-Bow depends on large amounts of inertia in the vessel to help delay those pitch motions, i.e. big things are slower to start moving. Now, by the time that bow truly tries to nosedive and pitch down into the water, the wave has already passed the initial section of the bow and moved on to the shoulders, which is where most of the buoyancy kicks in to sustain the weight of the ship. I think that delay effect and that inertia effect is crucial for the X-Bow to work properly. Plus, as I mentioned, the X-Bow usually has the first exposed deck two to three decks above the main. 
When you're talking a large vessel, that usually results in a clearance of 7 to 8 meters above the main deck, and that's critical to protect the bridge deck from excessive spray. You typically won't see that many decks on a smaller vessel. So personally, I think the X-Bow has many uses, but I would hesitate before applying it to smaller vessels. Option number three, the Axe Bow. The Axe Bow also prioritizes providing a smoother ride for the crew, but with applications focusing on smaller vessels. Developed by Damon Shipyards, the Axe Bow features a plumb stem with very long, very fine lines for the entrance. You're going to see these very small half angles of entrance here. Now with this design, the keel actually drops downwards as it moves towards the bow resulting in an axe-shaped profile, hence the name Axe Bow. If you were to look at the cross section, you would see that the Axe Bow employs straight vertical sides that also work to create a linear resistance to waves, much of the same intent as the X Bow. It results in smoother pitching motions. But the Axe Bow does not extend for multiple decks above the main deck. Instead, the secret to the Axe Bow lies in the weight distribution. The axe bow originally evolved from a previous study of something called an enlarged ship concept. This was a desk study conducted by Delft University. They asked what would happen if you were to lengthen the bow of a ship, allow it to have a longer length rather than trying to squish everything into as short of a length as possible. In this study, the lengthened bow was essentially just empty space. There was no outfitting or other weights placed into that space. To oversimplify things, the study showed that improvements to the efficiency, the transport economy, were all realized with this longer bow, and more importantly, it resulted in reductions to the pitch accelerations, i.e. smoother ride for the crew. I keep emphasizing the empty bow section because weight distribution was key to this enlarged bow, in my opinion. With all the weight focused near the aft end of the vessel, this long bow presented a huge moment arm. Even with a thin bow section, that long length meant that the vessel was fairly sensitive and could react slowly to pitch motions with oncoming waves. And so the result is that the vessel is going to gradually pitch up to match the wave slope and follow the contour of the wave long before the bulk of the vessel's weight reaches the wave. End result, very minimal pitching motions, and you're just contouring the wave itself. At least that's how I would interpret this. So Damon took this concept of an extended ship and then expanded it with a few more features to yield what we now call the axe bow. The axe bow has many of the same advantages and disadvantages as the X bow. Smoother pitch motions, though you are having a little bit of problem with larger wind areas forward. Uh, you could have a slight problem with broaching on the axe bow. So these are all things that need to be considered and compensated for in the design. The main difference though between these two is that the axe bow works on smaller vessels. I could even see this working on planing craft. This bow doesn't rely on vessel inertia. It focuses on using that long movement arm of the extended bow length. Now of course, that means you can't fill that front section of the bow with loads of weight, otherwise you're defeating the whole point. Now before we move on, I feel that the mystery of that keel also warrants a little further explanation. As I said, the axe bow could be applied to planing vessels, and one of the largest dangers to planing vessels is wave slamming. When a section of the hull becomes airborne and then it collides with the water on re-entry, that feels like hitting a hard concrete wall. That impact poses a serious structural hurdle to the high-speed vessels. So Damon's trick was that they dropped that keel line to increase the depth of the hull forward. This prevents the bottom of the bow from leaving the water. No exit from the water, you don't have any re-entry with no slamming, so no problem. Item number four, the wave piercing bow. Unlike all the previous concepts, the wave piercing bow completely abandons any attempt to keep the main deck dry. You see wave piercing bows on skinny monohulls that are more submarine than surface ship, or on large monohulls where the cross deck sits very far above the main hulls. So why do we do this? Well, the wave piercing hull 
focuses on maintaining the forward speed in the presence of waves. And I just want to clarify a little bit of the characteristics here. See, many people assume a wave piercing hull anytime they see a bow with a reverse rake or a skinny width. Myself, I think the critical feature to categorize something as a wave piercing hull is that teardrop shape of the cross section. Let's talk some more about that teardrop shape. The magic of a wave piercer lies in that shape of the cross section. Due to the inward slope on the top of the hulls, as the wave passes along the length of that bow, that inward slope drives the hull downwards. This driving force counterbalances the natural upward force of buoyancy as the hull submerges. Now ideally, the hydrodynamic and hydrostatic forces balance out to net out with almost no pitching moment. But to do this, the hulls still need to be very, very narrow. They need to work like a knife cutting through the waves to limit that pitching motion. See, without the severe pitching motion, the hull doesn't try to flip up over the waves, so we don't lose our forward speed. As I said, the main advantage of a wave piercer is that consistent forward speed. Some people also claim that those narrow skinny hulls try to reduce peak accelerations from pitching. I wouldn't be so sure about that though myself. We still get wave slamming action. That wide underside of the bow is going to still frequently encounter waves as it becomes airborne and re-enters. So you're, so you're still going to have that hard jerk motion from wave slamming. And I also want to clarify here, don't confuse reducing pitch motions with reducing pitch accelerations. Pitch motions means we can drive straight and level by going under the waves. Pitch accelerations though means we're still going to be jerking back and forth. Finally, let's also talk about one of the main consequences. Wave piercing bows do nothing to shed spray or green water. Indeed, they actually encourage green water on deck. So with a wave piercer, you need to plan to get wet, or you need to put your main deck far, far, far above the waterline. These four bow types may look similar, but the subtle differences optimize them for vastly different applications. Each bow type has its own specialty. Now what I have covered here today are just guidelines. They provide a basic framework to begin categorizing the various bows and comparing their relative merits. Customizations and interesting little tricks are always available. The main moral for this video is to remember the perfect bow will never exist. Don't try to find one bow that can solve every problem in the world. Instead, focus on identifying your own needs and priorities and selecting the bow type that's perfect for you. Thanks very much. I'm Nick the Naval Architect. Active heave compensation. Stability tests done from start to finish. Four ways to break your structure. Statistics and sea keeping. These are just some of the videos that I have planned for the future. If you want to see more amazing videos about ships, then click that like button or subscribe if you're new to the channel. I'll see you next time for more awesome insights about boats.